Oscar. In this video lecture, I'm going to talk about pulse chase experiment or pulse chase technique. This is a technique that is used in cell biology or in molecular biology. It is generally used to study the stability of a biomolecule or its movement inside the cell. It is also used to study the direction of, uh, of, his, of the synthesis of a particular biomolecule. Say for example in DNA replication you can study uh, in which direction the DNA synthesis occurs, whether it occurs bidirectionally in the replication bubble or not using this pulse chase experiment. We will see uh, how this experiment has been utilized to, uh, to analyze various kind of uh, problems in biological science. <coughs> So basically pulse chase means uh, you are first labeling the biomolecule with, uh, with a radioactive precursor. You are incorporating the radioactive precursor within a particular biomolecule for a short period of time and then you are chasing it with, uh, with the non-radioactive uh, precursor. You are incorporating non-radioactive pre precursor after, uh, after a certain period of time. So your biomolecule gets labeled with, uh, with the radioactive substance uh, for a certain period of time and then it is present in the cell, the process is going on and at certain time, after certain period of time you are uh, taking the cell and you are extracting the molecule or you are making slides and doing autoradiogram uh, out of that to, to analyze where, where the, that molecule has moved or what is the condition or status of that molecule inside the cell. So, once one type of in vivo study you can do uh, using this pulse chase experiment. So one of the uh, first experiment that uh, in which pulse chase was used was to decipher that how protein secretion occurs in the cell. Uh, the secretory pathway of uh, protein that starts from the rough endoplasmic reticulum then it moves to the um, Golgi bodies and with the help of the secretory vesicles, uh, the proteins are released outside the cell. This was studied way back in 1970s by Palade and his group and for that they also won a uh, Nobel Prize. So here is the picture, if you see, this is the uh, first, uh, what they did, let me explain you first what they did. They took exocrine pancreatic cells and they fed those cells with, uh, with tritiated leucine. This is the radioactive precursor. Leucine is an amino acid that will get incorporated into the protein when protein synthesis is going on. So they grew the cells in um, tritiated leucine for three minutes and then they chased it with, uh, with a non-radioactive leucine, excess of non-radioactive leucine. To, to dilute the radioactive one uh, so that uh, the, the time being the time provided for, it, for incorporation of the radioactive leucine uh, is basically three minutes. After that they chase it with a non-radioactive precursor so uh, the protein after synthesized after that after three minutes will be non-radioactive and they studied uh, they did a time course that at three minutes duration where is the protein present and after 10 minutes, after 50 minutes, after one hour maybe, uh, you can, they did it for quite a long time for two hours duration, where is that protein, uh, is the protein going on, where is the protein there, how did they do that, when the proteins get labeled with radioactive substances, uh, you do, uh, you have to prepare a slide, you have to fix the cells and then uh, you have to develop it in the x-ray film. Uh, what that is called autoradiogram and then you can use electron microscope. Uh, electron microscopy was uh, was discovered uh, maybe 20 years back or 30 years back, 1932, Noel Ruska, they had discovered uh, electron microscopy and this Palade and Cloud, these groups were uh, using this electron microscopy as well as the cell fractionation techniques to, uh, to understand the cell organelles, uh, the various functions and uh, structures of cell organs. So while doing that, they prepared an autoradiogram and then when they observed under the electron microscope after three minutes of duration, they could see that most of the proteins are present in the endoplasmic reticulum. These are the endoplasmic reticula, you can see. Uh, these are the proteins, this black, black, these are the proteins. And mm, this area, this, this particular, this entire area, this is the endoplasmic reticulum. 
these layers, uh, you can see that the rough endoplasmic reticula, they are engaged in protein synthesis. The proteins are, uh, pack, uh, are delivered in the lumen of the endoplasmic reticulum. Uh, and when they chased it after three minutes and did the same study after seven minutes, the proteins were moved to, uh, they have demarcated with the arrow that this is the periphery of the Golgi uh, bodies. So proteins moved to the Golgi region, Golgi after, t after seven minutes of, uh, of duration. So when you, when you see the cells after seven minutes, you find the proteins to be moving into the Golgi bodies. And then from the Golgi bodies, none of the proteins are present in these vesicles. These are uh, Golgi vesicles or zymogen granules. And after about 37 minutes, the proteins moved into these vesicles. You can uh, see this uh, in the diagram below this one yeah this is after 30 minutes of duration the proteins have moved into the into these vesicles these are condensing vesicles cv stands for that and these are the vesicles produced by the golgi bodies itself and then at, a, at about 117 minutes when they uh, uh, try to localize and see it they found to the, the protein to be delivered from these vesicles into the lumen into the, this is the area with this extracellular environment where the proteins have moved. This is the protein that is being, you can see these are the, these black, black, this is the protein present in the lumen, okay, and these vesicles are now empty, so proteins have been delivered into the lumen, that means they have moved. So what is the story? The story is this, that the proteins at the beginning, they are synthesized in the in the endoplasmic reticulum, rough endoplasmic reticulum, and then one thing is clear that the proteins never come out of, of uh, membrane-bound vesicles, and from the endoplasmic reticulum they move into the um, Golgi tubules, and from there they move into the Golgi vesicles. Uh, you can call it the secretory vesicles or the zymogen, and these secretory vesicles ultimately fuse with the plasma membrane, releasing the proteins outside. So this protein, this secretory pathway, the entire secretory pathway uh, was just deciphered by this pulse chase experiment. Isn't it beautiful? So similarly, there are many other things. Uh, if you want to study the stability of a protein, here one of the experiment, I have just taken it for, for the purpose of our understanding, but there are two proteins uh, the stability of those proteins have been studied here. One is this P53, wild type P53, and another is this, uh, the mutant version of it. In the mutant, uh, the 80, 81st amino acid has been uh, converted, has been converted from uh, threonine to alanine probably. Because of that, it has become mutant. You will verify this uh, single letter notations. I, I don't always remember that. So the thing is this, that normal wild type P53, uh, what is its function? The P53 is known as a guardian of the genome, it's very important uh, gene, uh, and the, its product P53 is the protein. Uh, it is a tumor suppressor protein. What it does, so when a cell uh, has a DNA damage, so the cell should not be allowed to enter into the S phase. So this P53 protein, at that time, it arrests the cells into the G1 phase by those uh, CDK4 or 6 and cyclin D and CDK2 cyclin E. With the help of those uh, CDK cyclin complexes, uh, the P53, uh, with the help of some other uh, uh, suppressor uh, proteins like P21, P16, there is a series of. Uh, the finally, the P53 is responsible for the cell arrest in the G1 phase if the, D, the cell has faced any kind of a mutagenic stress because of which this DNA damage has occurred. So the, at that time, the protein will, uh, the P53 protein will specifically will remain stable in the cell for quite a long time until and unless the DNA has got repaired, if it is possible. Otherwise, the, it will push the cell to apoptosis. That is cell death, programmed cell death. But the mutant version here, the P53 mutant protein, uh, it seems that it, it has been mutated at such a position that 
it doesn't become stable even when the protein gets damaged. Uh, the cell gets uh, 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 cell is under stress, mutagenic stress, and the DNA gets damaged. They could study this by this pulse experiment. What did they do? They feed the cell with a this time not with a tritiated thymogen, tritiated leucine. Rather, in the I mean during 1950s, 60s, 70s, people used to use tritiated uh, uh, radioactive precursors, but Later on, it changed P32 or, or S35. Here, yet they used S35 methionine. So, mm, when they feed the cell with the S35 methionine, all the proteins get leveled with S35 methionine. Then they immunoprecipitate. I mean, they have the antibody, maybe monoclonal antibody or monomorphic polyclonal antibody. With the help of that, they immunoprecipitate the particular p53 protein from the all the types of proteins that are present in the cell they lyse the cell and then immunoprecipitate now first they uh, first they uh, incorporate the protein then they chase with a non radioactive uh, uh, precursor of uh, methionine uh, after that they, they immunoprecipitate the protein and then they run a gel electro process uh, sds page uh, followed by autoradiography and then they measure the band intensity to see how what is the level of status of or concentration of the protein uh, at a certain point of time. So here you can see 0, 30 minutes, 1 hour, 2.5 hours, 5 hours, like this at different time intervals they have measured. Uh, in case of control, I mean control is that where the cell has not uh, not been damaged or it, ha it has not, not faced any stress situation like this ultraviolet that has been given. So control is that. So it is normal. When the cell is in normal condition, the P53 level will be down because P53 is a suppressor. It's a cell division suppressor. So since there is no DNA damage, it will allow the cell to enter into the S phase. So P53 level will be less. It will get degraded by proteasomal mechanism with the help of that MDM2 and all that. You will, we will talk about that in some other lecture. So. Uh, in uh, under uh, normal condition, both P53 wild type as well as the mutant, both are getting gradually decreasing, uh, decreased. You can see the band intensity uh, is decreasing here, isn't it? And also here. So in both the cases, the band intensity because the P53 should not be more in normal condition. So that's why it is uh, uh, gradually when when the, when you label it and you um, purchase it with a non radioactive precursor and then you uh, do a time course and uh, you find that the level is decreasing uh, uh, according to the time. But when you when the cell was uh, given a stress with UVC radiation, then that means the cell the DNA has got damaged and the cell has sensed a, and a problem that the DNA has to be repaired and that in the under that condition P53 will will become stable in the cell. <coughs> that is, also, that is uh, what is what was found in the experiment. See, the band intensity is quite, uh, I mean, same in, uh, even after five hours of duration. And then suddenly it falls to, in, in the next, I mean, next hour or 10 hours of duration when uh, this has to be uh, fractionated further. But the mutant uh, P53, uh, it had a gradual decline in its uh, concentration. That means uh, the, here that is a different study that they wanted to see the, what kind of mutation is this, whether this site P81, first amino acid uh, is uh, crucial for the function of P53 or not. That is a different story. But from this experiment, what we mean, I mean to say, I have taken this as an example, that by pulse chase experiment, you can study the stability, the half-life of proteins. Similarly, you can study the half-life of uh, RNA molecules. I will not show you that here. Otherwise, the rather, I will talk about something about the DNA replication in which it has also been utilized. Uh, it was Cairns who labeled the E. coli DNA by tritiated thymidine for one and a half generation to understand that this replication is semi-conservative or not. So in his experiment, he was able to say that the, okay, the replication is semi-conservative. It is true, okay, because what happened here, not clear from this picture, but uh, let me tell you that one and half generation means what? Uh, you are beginning with a chromosome double-stranded DNA, which was non -le not radioactive leveled. 
you grow for one generation, then what will happen? One of the parental strand will be unlabeled, the new strand will be labeled, radioactively labeled. So you have a half labeled, half unlabeled uh, chromosome, DNA. And then you follow up in the second generation and in the half, not the full second generation, after half generation, you stop uh, the cells to grow further and you take out the cell and spread the chromosome on the slide and do an extra emulsion of that. Then you find, then what will happen? There, there are two strands already. One of the strand is radio level, another strand is not radio level. So a replication bubble will be formed at one place and a new DNA synthesis will begin. This new DNA will be again be radio level. So in, in the bubble, one of these strand is, is unlabeled, the other strand is labeled. And new DNA that is being formed is also labeled. So one of these, I mean the, the double-stranded DNA that is being newly formed will be completely labeled, the other will be half labeled. I mean one of the strand is older one that is unlabeled one. So when you do an autoradiogram, the band, the intensity of this uh, will differ. The one that is, uh, I mean the single strand is labeled, that will have a less intensity in the autoradiogram. And that was quite, uh, uh, almost quite visible. This particular strand, this particular, I mean, loop is more intense than uh, this one in the autoradiogram. This is the, I mean, the chromosome and this is the loop that is in the, the bubble, the replication bubble that has been formed. This is the theta model of replication. From this theta model of replication was revealed. So one thing was clear from this experiment that DNA replication is semi-conservative because uh, of that this kind of a result has come. But uh, whether this replication inside the replication bubble, I mean the, this particular area, this replication bubble, whether it takes place from in both the uh, fox or from one place to the other, how, what is the direction of that, uh, whether it occurs bidirectionally or not, it was not clear from this experiment because this was not a pulse chase experiment. So when this same experiment was done in a pulse chase uh, manner, I mean, when the, the cells were fed with a treated thymidine for a short period of time, then they were dilute, then it, they were chased with a excess of non-radioactive thymidine. Uh, then what happened, <coughs> the, uh, you will get You'll, when you prepare the autoradiogram, what we will get? You will get this at certain place, the amount of radioactivity will be high and it will gradually decrease uh, to, a, to a certain region. By that, you will be able to say that, okay, now you can say that oh, this is the replica, I mean, replication bubble that has been, I mean, formed here. We can derive, draw a diagram like this. So, in both these replication fork, fork replication is taking place. In both these forks, replication is taking place. Uh, this was evident by this pulse charge experiment. Again, here what they did, one, one more thing they did, that they diluted the radioactive substance gradually. And from, uh, by, by that, by doing that, they were able to say that, okay, replication, the origin of replication is somewhere here. And from that place, uh, maybe, maybe here, for the, both the forks, in one fork, one fork, it goes in this direction, and the other fork, it goes in this direction. So this was uh, the story of pulse stage experiment. There are many such experiments uh, by which uh, many things uh, in biological, I mean, uh, molecular biological problems were solved by this pulse stage experiment. So I hope I'm, uh, I have been able to make you understand to some extent, if there is some problem, if you feel something to add, you please comment in the comment box, put, put your opinion in the comment box or you question in the comment box, if I'm able to answer, I'll be happy. Thanks a lot.